Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. We're going to begin first here with an animation from GOES-16 looking at our visible satellite channel from yesterday as the sun was setting here across parts of the western United States. You can see the storms as you get up here into parts of Nebraska, South Dakota. These actually extended into North Dakota, and in the overnight hours, these raced across the eastern parts of these states into Minnesota, providing a lot of, of lightning and thunder and some pretty heavy rainfall. Meanwhile, did the south of it. Some big storms blew over parts of western Texas and through here, bringing some rain to some fields and places that have not seen it in quite some time. But I imagine your eyes kind of drawn back over to parts of Arizona and pockets in New Mexico where we can see some of the, the fires, uh, the smoke from some of the fires. And zooming in there, just take a look at this animation. Some of these smoke plumes are absolutely enormous as uh, they get pulled here into this southwesterly wind that has really just raced across much of the central plains of the United States not only over the last week or so, which is what's shown here, this is maximum hourly average wind speeds from June 14th through the 17th. And just notice, take a look at my color bar. This is the 30 to 40 mile an hour range. And we have just seen some extremely windy conditions in this area, not only over the last week, but before that as well. Now, I tweeted this out yesterday and also put it into our long range forecast, but at this particular video has a lot broader audience, so I wanna bring this back up again. What I did was I looked back over the last 30 days and made a map of the daily average surface wind speed anomaly, which means when you average it all together, this section of the central plains of the United States was sitting between six and 10 miles an hour with every day with faster winds than normal. And at times we had gusts, of course, that were getting 60, 70, 80 miles an hour. And the central plains has just been rocked by these strong southwest winds causing major, major problems for a lot of folks. In fact, if you just look, the whole of North America has been very windy. Now, some of the reasoning behind this is actually seen in the map, and we're going to talk at the end of this video about what's going on here in the tropics and how critical it will be to watch those winds compared to the winds in the extra tropics, especially here in the Gulf of Alaska and in the North Atlantic. So I just wanted to kind of confirm that those folks that were feeling the incredibly strong winds in the central plains of the United States, it is, of course, not your imagination. It's practically record setting in that area. The problem has been that this same area right in through here has largely missed out on a lot of precipitation, not only since the beginning of June, but actually going back about 30 days. There are some places in the south central United States that have not seen any of uh, rainfall in the last 30 days. Now, this particular map, which is showing you calculated soil moisture change, does find where Cristobal went through. And I want to highlight this one more time because if you see where the heaviest rains of Cristobal passed through parts of Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, Missouri, and then eastern Iowa, Wisconsin, you get just to the east of that. And there are places that are in here that have been dry for not just the last seven or eight days, but some places 15 to 20 days. And therefore, the rainfall forecast that's coming through is going to be critical. Meanwhile, we will be seeing major changes here over in parts of North Carolina and Virginia from the cutoff load that's been stuck there. And the rain that went through overnight last night is going to at least help with some of the drier soils that we do see in parts of the eastern Dakotas and Minnesota. So with that as a backdrop, I want to show you one last thing about winds, and dust, and dryness. In 2013, I won't forget, uh, early season forecasts for that hurricane season were very high. But one of the things that kept impacting any tropical system that developed in 2013 was stuff like this. This is an animation now, not from 2013, but over the next several days here, over the next five days, showing you where the dust is being pulled off of the Saharan and blown here across. Well, it's eventually getting over to the Lesser Antilles. It could make its way through the Caribbean into the Gulf of Mexico, what could happen is early next week, bringing some Saharan dust all the way into the south central part of the United States. So this is a pretty amazing thing to see here, and it's going to be a critical piece looking forward at what our hurricane season could be if we keep getting dust plumes like this coming off of Africa. Now, this is a map I didn't think I'd be showing you. It's the 18th of June, and going from the 15th to the 18th, that's snow. We picked up in some places like the Payette National Forest and the Sawtooth Mountains in Idaho upwards of a foot of snowfall. That got into southern Montana as well into parts of Wyoming and northern Utah. 
The trough that brought this in here was relatively deep, and it brought a lot of unsettled weather into the Pacific Northwest over the last seven days. The storms that you do see down here in parts of the Southwest, specifically over parts of New Mexico, many of these storms, we could intercept the rain shafts with radar, which is why you see it here on the map, but a lot of this rain didn't hit the ground, and so we get what we call Virga. Meanwhile, just notice that inside this area I'm kind of shading here, some places in there have gone a long time without rainfall. And don't think that the rain that came through here was adding a whole lot to the drier conditions that are in the eastern Corn Belt. Where it has been extremely wet has been under the cutoff low that has passed through parts of Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, where over the last week some places have picked up between 3 and 10 inches of rainfall. All right, in the early morning hours, you can watch here up to about 4 o'clock where the storms moved through in the overnight, and they're still sitting right about here early, early this morning. A lot of lightning in some of these storms, so I imagine a lot of folks were up with me early uh, as these storms went racing through. But take a look at this pattern. We're going to start right in the middle with this high or low pattern. So there is an upper level low sitting here, and there is a high pressure cell that's sitting just to its north. So there's the low, and there's the high. Now with the flow doing something like this, this pattern is stalled, it's not moving. And with the cutoff flow that's been sitting over the Carolinas and Virginia all week, slowly moving its way out, it's going to still take a few more days to get this pattern to move. What will kick it out is this trough right here, which will eventually sweep on the back side of this and then race off in this direction, finally moving this all out. But there is another low that's sitting here uh, just off the Aleutian Islands that is going to be making its way midweek, stalling a boundary out in this area, possibly bringing in some more precipitation. That should come in on a bit of northwest flow, which means our week two precipitation forecast could also be you know, including some more stormy conditions. So what are we dealing with today in terms of the winds? Well, look at where the front will be by midday. It'll be stalled out in this area with strong winds on the backside and relatively strong winds on the south side. So this boundary is not moving, but it'll be on that boundary that our thunderstorms will be forming. Now, important thing to notice, do you see how we're not getting moisture transport out of the Gulf coming up through like Louisiana or through the Delta? Instead, it's coming out of this part of Texas. And ultimately, that is what the major challenge is going to be in forecasting the rainfall on the tail end of this front down here, because it's understanding that moisture source, which is critical. Meanwhile, the drier conditions that have been in this area will likely prevent a lot of these storms making their way to the east as soon as many of us would like to see them moving to the east here for those of us in the eastern Corn Belt. So I want to talk about precip first now. The map you're looking at is from the WPC, released 4 o'clock this morning. This is their next week's worth of anticipated rainfall. The southern tail of this, I've got some big questions about. I also am curious how far back to the west we are able to get this half inch to inch rainfall. And then I think if you drew a line that kind of went from, I don't know, Dallas, maybe up to St. Louis, and then caught Interstate 55 up to Chicago, I think if you get to the east of that line I just drew, the precipitation forecasts are going to be very difficult to pin down, and that goes all the way from parts of Arkansas clear up into Michigan. What we see over here is still what's left over from the cutoff low, so still adding quite a bit more rainfall uh, into parts of like Virginia, West Virginia, then moving up into the Northeast. So to understand this, I'm going to give you a multi-model analysis, and we're going to start first with the GFS. The GFS, surprisingly, from its 0 Z run last night, I think did the best job here with the rains that came through in the overnight, some places picking up quite a bit of rainfall there. You can see that the heaviest rainfall corridor here over the next few days, again, this is Thursday today through Monday morning, it extends from parts of Iowa all the way down into north central Texas. We do see dry conditions here. We see drier conditions here. But I'm going to get my drawings off there because I'd like to show you the difference between the forecast between today on Thursday through Monday morning between the GFS and now the European. Now, if I were to go back and forth between this, and I'm sitting down here in parts of north central Texas or Oklahoma, the differences are, I mean, alarming. Same thing through parts of Missouri. Same thing on the back side of this, getting into parts of western Kansas and over into parts of Colorado. And then notice how the European is waiting until next week before any precipitation likely gets into that area that I just circled. We do have another model I can add into this that I have a bit of confidence in, and that's going to be the ICON model from Germany. And you can see that it's very much in line with the European on the precipitation patterns here. Uh, what it doesn't have, uh, like the GFS does, is also the really heavy rain down in this part of Texas. 
Now with a slow moving boundary through this area and a lack of really strong moisture transport out of the Gulf and instead it's coming through Texas, this is why our precipitation forecasts are, are really going to be all over the place and quite bad. Western Corn Belt, I think you're in the best position to get the most rain out of this. And the bigger question becomes, who gets the rain by the time we get into the first week of July? Because who got it will determine who can survive the longest should July turn hot and dry for the midsection of the country. And I got some question marks on that. All right, we've gone to Monday. What about going from Monday to Thursday? Remember the system I showed you that was over the Gulf of Alaska? Well, it will be moving down here in the European model, bringing a boundary right in through here, meaning that the Eastern Corn Belt, getting back over into Southern Illinois, Missouri, and into Oklahoma, could get some precipitation from next Monday to next Thursday as that boundary sits right in through this area. The European also favors some tropical development coming up here early next week that could possibly just soak south central Texas. Now, are you ready for the next slide? This is the GFS on the same time period. If I go back and forth, you can see a lot of pieces missing. The GFS brings the boundary farther to the south. In fact, it brings in some much cooler air behind it compared to the European and a lot different precipitation regime, especially for Oklahoma. So I normally at this point step over and show you one of the models rolling through every six hours. I'm not going to do that. It is only going to add to confusion with this. And what I'm going to tell us to do is watch this day by day to see the models evolve and to see how the precipitation actually falls as we work our way out into the next week. Now this is what's interesting. Getting out to day 10, what I want to tell you is the pattern overall remains unblocked. And that is critical as we begin the month of July. I got a trough here with an extending trough that gets into the Aleutian Islands, another piece that comes over British Columbia. We have this trough exiting, which is going to be important, but ridges that build up here into the Gulf of Alaska and one that's coming here up into the North Atlantic. But still, another trough here and there, and the waves just aren't long enough to get me overly concerned about the pattern getting really blocked up and shut down, which would be bad for the month of July. So what do we see as we finish out June and get in July? Well, the week two from the GFS Ensemble is here, and it's over here from the European. The European's favoring at times as we get out to the next 10 days some northwest flow, and that just opens a corridor for thunderstorms. It's also got some tropical moisture coming into Texas, which we just saw. And remember, to start week two, there was that boundary stalled in through here, which is why we see wetter conditions in this area. The GFS also has some of that northwest flow and that boundary, but again, we just see the both models painting this area wet. The difference being the GFS is a little tardy here on bringing in what could be some tropical moisture out of, you know, the east coast of Mexico into Texas. So we got to watch that all very carefully if you're in south central Texas. All right, from here, let's now talk about the bigger moving pieces. Our La Nina is still going, and there's still some cooler water beneath it that will be resurging, uh, replacing that cooler water that's uh, sitting in this area. So for the United States, your most critical piece to be watching that will be moving through July and August will be that La Nina. The North Pacific is still very warm, though, which is going to be um, the, the two features that I think are going to compete against one another the most over the next 45 days or so. But what does that La Nina mean? Well, the La Nina at this point is being overridden by the fact that the Mad Julian Oscillation is kind of stealing the tropical show. Now, what I mean by that is the MJO is not moving. It's stuck. It's stalled over the standing wave in Africa, and it's keeping the best upper level support sitting over phases one, two, and three. See it? And even at the end of this forecast, getting to the beginning of July, it tends to like retrograde back here to the west. Normally, remember, the MJO progresses east. We do see it progressing east here. Do you see how we bring in favorable upper level motion over this part uh, of like the Caribbean, the Western Atlantic and the Gulf, which is why we saw in the European model better support for some tropical development sooner in southern Texas. But adding to that, I want to look at bullet points number two and three. Remember, our global atmospheric angular momentum dropped down to one standard deviation below average. In fact, one and a half standard deviations. But all that loss of momentum was primarily in the southern hemisphere. I'm going to come back to that in a second. The MJO is also causing problems with using our southern oscillation index to kind of understand what the La Nina is doing because the SOI is negative six right now. That's an El Nino-like pressure pattern with a big westerly wind burst coming out around 120 east. So the tropics are not advertising 
any sort of pattern that we could be using to make a confident guess into the longer range forecast. What is the most important thing to be watching is the North Pacific and North Atlantic. Anything that blocks it up or changes the speed I'm concerned about. And right now, this is what I see. To begin the month of July, these winds in the North Pacific are near average. That's good. In the North Atlantic, near average. But we see what's going on here. If the, we could kind of trace out the flow pattern, I believe that the jet stream is moving a bit farther to the north, maybe than the climatological average. Now, if it does that, does that mean it shuts down precipitation? No, it doesn't. But what it does mean is that the forecast for the month of July in terms of temperatures is probably closer to right here when we look at the European. Just saying the month is really favoring slightly above average temperatures with maybe the greatest warmth out west compared to normal. I am finding myself buying in more to this long range forecast. Now we're going to get a brand new update later on today on Thursday for these long range weekly forecasts and I'll put it in my Friday morning regional content. So we'll take a closer look at that too and of course we'll discuss it next week as well. From there, let's talk temperatures in, in the near term. So today, warmth from Texas all the way up into the Great Lakes. See this here? But you can find the boundary and you can also see where the cutoff low is still spinning over the mid-Atlantic getting it down here into the Carolinas. Now as I play this forward, parts of from Texas getting up into the Great Lakes are going to see a few days of, of quite warm temperatures getting up here you can see in, into the 90s uh, into this area but on the back side look at the colder air that's coming in as that trough finally moves into the central plains of the United States. As we work our way into the weekend on Saturday, here's what our temperatures look like. But watch the West Coast for Sunday, getting into Monday and Tuesday. Central Valley of California here going back over to triple digit heat. Very hot. And it's also going to be very hot and dry down in the southwestern part of the United States. Meanwhile, Tuesday into Wednesday, look at the near average to cooler than average weather that pulls into here as the flow pattern features a broader ridge west and a trough coming into the midsection of the United States. That keeps our six to 10 day pattern with a cool bias here. Now, when you look at this, I don't want you to be thinking that we're gonna be getting temperatures like in the 60s and 70s. No, this is saying that the temperatures are gonna stay in the low 80s inside that oval with big time heat pulling out into the western part of the United States as you just saw. As we got to the 11 to 15 day, I am leaning more on the European model solution for this, which is overall featuring Something that comes into a trough a little bit into the northwest, but then a much more northerly trajectory to the jet stream saying that this area will likely be seeing near average to above average temperatures. I think the GFS is a bit too high amplitude with this uh, at this point, bringing in that, that, that cooler anomaly at that point. All right. From here, what I want to finish with is a quick update of some international things. We're going to go to China first. GRACE, our satellite-based uh, measurement of soil moisture, showing root zone soil moisture below average in this area. Now, why that's critical is that over the next week or so, we are seeing the stalling out of the Mayu front in between where I'm drawing here, potentially dropping lots and lots and lots of rainfall. Now, Beijing is sit it sits right here. So the fields that surround Beijing are looking at widely scattered precip, not heavy. North of the Korean Peninsula may be better chances of rainfall. But given that this area, let me just shade it in for you, has been dry going another seven to 10 days where all the heaviest rain and flooding is south, we're gonna have continual drought development north and flooding south. And finally, going over to Europe, surrounding the Black Sea over the last week, I was just watching a satellite animation of this. We've seen some pretty regular thunderstorm activity, uh, just basically almost orbiting a low that's been sitting over the Black Sea. But where it's been dry, according to the CPC Unified Gauge Network, has been over in parts of eastern Ukraine, northern Ukraine, uh, and then getting here where I've just kind of shaded in into the Russian wheat belt. Over this next week, that same area is showing up dry in the forecast, but quite a bit of rainfall when you get to the west of the line I just drew there into the rest of Ukraine. So I want to keep you up to date on what's going on here. We'll keep an eye on it, keep you posted, okay? Hope you all have a great rest of your day. I look forward to giving you more updates soon. Thank you.